Hi everyone, thanks for joining me today. So today I would like to talk about Markov chains. And actually I have already used Markov chains in a couple of other talks. One of them was on irreversibility where I used the Ehrenfest Earn model, which is an example of Markov chain. And the other one is the talk on Monte Carlo Markov chain methods, such as the Metropolis Rosenbluth Rosenbluth Teller Teller algorithm, which also uses a Markov chain. But at that time, I didn't give a lot of details on the theory of these uh, mathematical processes, and today I want to give a bit more background for those of you who don't know that very nice theory. So let me start with a few examples and the the first quite easy example I call the mouse in a maze. So we have here a maze, it's a rather simple maze with uh, five different rooms and uh, currently in the picture the mouse is in room number one and let us assume that the mouse uh, explores the maze according to the following rules. So there's a time unit so every perhaps every minute or every second it doesn't really matter so every time unit the mouse will change the room it is in and the rule is that it looks at the number of doors leaving the room and it will choose one of these doors uniformly at random. So this means that right now the mouse is in room number one and it can leave it through three different doors like this, like this or like this. So it will choose one of these possibilities and each with probability one third. And once it has done that it will, let's say it is in room number two, so when it is in room number two well, it, there are two doors, so it will either go, go to room number four or back to room number one, and so on. However, there are uh, special cases, which are room number four and five. So number four is a place where there's some food, and we're going to assume that once the mouse finds the food, it will stay there for a long while. And the other case is room number five, which is its uh, hole or den or whatever you call the place where a mouse will uh, go to sleep, for instance. And there also we are going to assume that it will spend a long time if it reaches its den. And the questions we are going to ask are the following. So the main question is, what is the probability of the mouse finding the food before it returns to its den. Right, because the way we describe the process, where well, the mouse is uh, maybe going back and forth a few times and at some point it will either find the food or its den and then it will stay there. And uh, another question one can ask is what is the time until this happens and this time is actually a, a random uh, quantity because of the random nature of uh, the motion of the mouse. So that is random. So since it's random we can for instance ask what is the, the mean, the average of this uh, uh, random time. Now there are a number of ways of uh, looking at that problem uh, and you don't need the theory of Markov chains to, to treat it. So one way of looking at it is to say, okay, let's build a, a tree. So the mouse starts in room number one and then there are three options. So it can go to room number two, to room number three or to room number five and each time the probability is one-third. Now, as we said, if it 
goes to room number five, it just stays there, so we stop uh, mon monitoring the process. But if it goes to room number two, we've seen that there are two options, so it can go to room number one again, and it can go to room number four, and again now the probabilities are one half and one half, and if it reaches num room number four, it stops. If it is uh, at time one in room number three, it has again the options of going to rooms number one or four with probabilities of one half each. And it stops if it reaches room number four. So now we have two cases out of these uh, four or five different cases where it is back in room number one. And in that case, well, we start over again. So we again have three possibilities. And you see that actually we are going to uh, prune the same, or rather graft the same tree uh, at these places. So we are going to have uh, things like this and like this and like this and like this and uh, keep doing this. So we will get an infinite tree, which is, has some kind of self-similar structure. And, uh, okay, we can try to analyze this tree here. Now, uh, <coughs> if I call F the event that the mouse finds the food, we are actually interested in probabilities so P1 would be the probability starting in room number one that the mouse finds the food. So the one here would be the starting point. But we can do the same with two and three, two and three. And we can write the following kind of things. So P1, I can write by decomposing according to the next room the mouse is going to visit. So with probability one third, it is going to visit room number two. And then it is going to find the food with probability P2. So actually I'm using here properties of conditional probabilities. Or with probability one third, it is going to uh, room number three. And then I put P3 here. And with probability a third, it goes to room number five. But then it cannot find the food before being in the, the dead. And now I can write something similar starting from room number two. So I will have one half times P1 plus one half, and well, if it goes to room number four, the probability of finding the food, given that is, is actually one. So P4 is one. And P3 is also given by one half P1 plus one half times one. Now this gives you a system of three equations with three unknowns and linear equations, so it's quite simple to solve the system. And uh, if you do that, you will find that P1 is one half, P2 is three quarters, and P3 is three quarters. So starting from room number one, the mouse has a 50% chance of finding the food first. But if it starts in room number two or three, it has a 75% chance of finding the food first. Now this is uh, the kind of thing that we want to be able to do in a more systematic way, for instance, for much larger mazes. So let me discuss a second example, which is uh, called Penny's Game. So in Penny's Game, we have two players that uh, throw uh, an unbiased coin. So it's a version of head and tails. Uh, 
But the difference with the usual head and tails is that each player chooses a sequence. So let's say that player A chooses the sequence three heads in a row. So they can also choose the length of the sequence, but now let's assume that the length is three. So this means that player A will win if the coin lands uh, three times in a row on heads. And player B will choose another sequence of the same length. So let's say uh, it is tail, heads, tail. And the question is, again, what is the probability that A wins or B wins? And of course, you can ask the same question for uh, different sequences. They could be different sequences of length three or of so longer sequences. Now, <coughs> the way we are going to model this is again by looking at the number of states and uh, transition probabilities between these states. So first we have to ask how are we going to choose these states? And one thing that comes to mind is uh, we don't need to keep all the past in, in memory because each new coin throw is independent of the past. That's something we assume. So actually we just need to know the values of the three last coin throws. So that would be eight different states. But we can even do a bit better because if no one has won, well, it is sufficient to know the results of the last two coin throws and to keep in uh, somehow in memory if one of the players has won. So what we are going to do is use actually these six states here. So I have four states that keep just the two last results in, uh, in memory. And I have two states A and B, so that state would be A wins, and that state would be B wins. So let us assume I'm in state TT here, so meaning the last two uh, throws have given me tails and nobody has won yet. And then what can happen? Well, with probability one half, I'm going to uh, throw heads and in, if I get heads, then I update the last two uh, results, which will be tails and heads. So what I do is that here, if I get heads, I have a probability of one half of going to that state. And if I get tails, well, then I'm back in state TT. So with probability one half, if I get tails, I remain in that state. Now I can do the same for the other states. So if I'm in state tails heads, well, I can get heads. And if I get heads, I go to state heads heads. So again, with probability one half. And if I get tails, okay, one could think that we land in state heads tails here, but actually no, because then I, I have the sequence tails, heads, tails, and that means that B wins. So with probability one half, if I get tails, then B wins. And I can do that for the other states, and I end up with this graph here, this transition graph, to which I can add, if, if I want, actually two loops here, because the states A and B are what we are going to call absorbing states. So if I'm in one of these states, I will remain in that state. So how do we analyze this? Well, we could do the same as for the mouse in the maze. So look at probabilities that A wins uh, starting in one of these four uh, states on the left. Uh, but 
one can do things in a slightly more uh, useful way. And for that, okay, first I'm going to give a few definitions. So these two ex examples are Markov chains. So what is a Markov chain? Well, I'm given a certain number of states. So for the mouse, it was the five rooms of the maze. For Penny's game, it was these uh, six states we've just seen. So it could be a larger number of states. It could be an infinite number of states. And I give transition probabilities between the states. And the rule is that I choose some initial state or some initial distribution over states. And then uh, at each time step, I look in what state I am, and then I choose the next state according to the transition probabilities that are in the graph. And the important thing is that the transition I choose is independent of what happened before. That is called Markov's property, and that is why this is called a Markov chain. So one uh, definition is uh, the definition of being reachable. So I'm saying that state y is reachable from state x if I can get from x to y with a positive probability, but not necessarily in one step. It could be in many steps. Then I'm going to say that the state is absorbing if one cannot leave it. So in the first example of the mouse, it was the two uh, rooms with the food and the den. In Penny's game, it is A wins and B wins. And I'm going to say that my Markov chain is absorbing if for any state there exists at least one absorbing state that is reachable from it. So my two examples satisfy this condition. Now, <clears throat> let us look at some properties uh, of these uh, chains here. So first of all, I can represent my chain by a matrix. And so what is called the transition matrix, that's the matrix containing the transition probabilities. And in the example one of the mouse, I'm going to write this, so it's going to be a matrix of size 5 by 5, because there are five states. And one has to be careful, there are two conventions in the literature. So depending on what you call the starting and end state. So in mathematics, we typically use the convention where the rows give the starting state and the columns give the state where one goes. And in physics, often the reverse convention is used. So it doesn't matter what convention you use. You just have to work with transposes of matrices to go from one convention to the other. So here we have, these are the starting states. And the columns, I will number one, two, three, four, five, that are the end states. And since states four and five play a special role, let me draw two straight lines here. Okay, and now uh, what I do is that for each row, I put the transition probabilities to the different columns. So starting from one, we said that, okay, we, I don't stay in one, but I can go to room two or three each time with probability one third. And I can also go to room five. So in the column four, I put zero. Now I do the same for uh, the, the other starting points. So from room one, uh, two, I can go to room one. I can't go to room two or three, and I can also go to room four. That's where the cheese is. And actually, I have exactly the same thing happening if I start from room number three. 
Now, what happens for the last two rooms? Well, these are absorbing states. So it's states in which I will stay forever in my model. So I just put ones on the diagonals and zeros everywhere else. Now, you see that my matrix has this block form. So I actually, so here I have three non-absorbing states and two absorbing states. And in general, what I will have is that I will have here a matrix capital Q, which is a matrix of size Q by Q, if I have Q non-absorbing states. And R will be a matrix of size Q times R, where R is the number of absorbing states. And zero here is a matrix of size R times Q, which has zeros everywhere, like uh, at the bottom left here. And one will be an identity matrix with ones on the diagonal and zeros elsewhere of uh, size R. So that is what we call the standard representation of an absorbing Markov chain. Now, what is this matrix useful for? Well, if I now go uh, several steps, actually I will take powers of this matrix. So the nth power of the matrix will give me transition probabilities and n steps. So let us now uh, look at some properties of these absorbing chains. So first I claim that for an absorbing Markov chain, the matrix Q to the power n goes to zeros, the zero matrix, as n goes to infinity. Now the intuition behind that is, for instance, think of a room where you have lots of flies. Now, to get rid of the flies, you put a trap, like these, uh, this paper with glue on it, so that the fly that lands on the paper will get stuck. And what happens is, is that the flies move around the room more or less at random, but sooner or later they will all get stuck. And this Q to the N, that would correspond to the states where the flies are not stuck, and if I take a, a row sum of, uh, of Q to the N, that will give me, uh, given a certain starting point, the probability that there are still flies in the room, and that will go to zero, as, as we said. So that's the reason why this Q to the N will go to zero. Now, uh, I also claim that identity minus Q is invertible and the inverse is given by this infinite sum, identity plus q plus q squared, and so on. And this f is called the fundamental matrix of the chain. So the reason behind this result is actually uh, something that is well known for uh, numbers instead of matrices. It's called the uh, geometric series, and so how do you prove this, uh, this thing? Well, sim simply you compute identity minus Q times F, so that will be identity minus Q times this infinite sum, 1 plus Q plus Q square, and so on. Now, if I, I expand this product, I will get, well, Let's say first I take identity times all these terms in the sum, so it will give me identity plus q plus q square plus and so on. And <coughs> if I multiply everything by minus q, I will get minus q minus q square minus and so on. And you see that actually all these terms here cancel, so that in the end, I get the identity matrix, and that means that 
the inverse of identity minus Q is indeed this infinite sum. Now, the next property I claim is that as n goes to infinity, p to the power n converges to this particular matrix here, which has only zeros in the q left columns, and on the right side it is given by this product fr n identity. So how do we see this? Well, let me remind you that p has the form q r zero identity, and in fact I know that I can multiply matrices that are decomposed in blocks. If the blocks have the right dimensions, I can use the same rule as if I multiply just matrices with numbers. So if I want to compute P square, which is Q R zero identity times the same thing, then I use this rule where I multiply lines and columns, rows and columns, so the first element will be q times q plus r times 0, that will be q squared. Then I will get q times r plus r times 1, so q times r plus r. Then I will get 0 times q plus identity times 0, which is 0 in 0 times r plus identity times identity, which is identity. And then it's easy to see by induction that if we keep going like this, p to the n will be given by q to the n. Then I will have uh, something where I can factor the r, so I will have actually identity plus r and so on up to r power n minus 1 times uh, oh, its powers of q. So q plus q to the power n minus 1 times r. And uh, the bottom blocks will always be 0 in identity. And you see that as n goes to infinity, well, q to the n we've seen goes to 0, and here I keep 0 in identity, and this sum, well, it will converge to the fundamental matrix F, so I get F times R. And therefore, actually FR gives probabilities to reach the different absorbing states. Why is that? Well, you see that this limit of p to the n as n goes to infinity is gives me transition probabilities after an infinitely long time and uh, the top white block here gives me transition probabilities from non-absorbing to absorbing states so this is exactly what we have here now one other claim I make is that the line sums or row sums of F give expected absorption times. And the reason behind that is that if I take the ith uh, row sum of Q to the N, so I've said this already in words when I talked about the, uh, this example with the flies, well, that gives me the probability, starting from state i, not to have reached an absorbing state. So that we would write as probability starting from i that tau is larger than n, where tau is the absorption time. Now, if I now take f, so I take the i-th row sum of f, well, that will give me a sum of terms like this, so the probability starting from i that tau is larger than 0, plus the probability starting from i that tau is larger than 1, plus the same thing 
with two and so on. And this I can rewrite in a different way because it gives me uh, so the, the first probability contains in particular the probability starting from i that tau is equal to 1 and this I count only once. But the second term actually the two first terms also contain the probability that tau is equal to 2. So I get two times probability tau is 2 and then I get three times the probability that tau is 3 and so on and that is exactly the expectation starting from i of this type. So we have a certain number of results here for general absorbing Markov chains and now we can uh, apply this to our example. So here's let's do it for pennies game. We can, could do it for the mouse as well. So here my transition matrix will have will be of size six by six. It has thirty six states. And if I uh, write this in uh, the standard form, the Q matrix has the following form. So here I have numbered the states like this. So that is state 1, state 2, state 3, and state 4. So from state 1 I go back to state 1 with probability 1 half and to state 2 with probability 1 half and I do the same for the other states. The matrix R has the following form. So here I have put the states A and B and states 1, 2, 3, 4. So the only non-zero elements are from state 2 to B, which is here, and from state uh, 4 to A, which is here. Then the matrix F is uh, you have to compute. So F, we said, that is identity minus Q inverse. So either you use your computer to uh, make the computation or you use something like Gauss algorithm and after some time uh, you, you find this expression for f and then I can compute f times r and I get the following result here and again here uh, the columns correspond to a wins and b wins and the rows correspond to the states so that tells me that if I start from state 1, tail tails, then I have a probability of one third that A wins and two thirds that B wins. Okay, but what happens actually in the game is that we start with uh, sequences of length zero and then we start throwing coins. So the beginning of the game, the first two throws will give one of these four possibilities states one, two, three, four, each with probability one, one quarter. So actually the probability that A wins will be given by one quarter times A wins starting from state one, which is one third, and the same starting from state two and three, and then starting from state four, we get two thirds. And this actually gives me 5 over 12. So the probability that A wins is given by 5 over 12. Now, the other thing I can compute is I can compute row sums of the matrix F, and that g will give me expected uh, times until I reach. Uh, an absorbing state, so until someone wins. And, uh, okay, so for instance, the expectation starting from state one of the time until someone wins, well, it give, will be given by the first row sum, which is seven plus four plus one plus two divided by four. And that is, what is it? It is 14 over four 
so seven half, so three point five. And uh, if I do the same for the other three rows and I take the average of that, I will get the average length of the game, average duration. So these are two examples of absorbing uh, Markov chains. Now let's look at some other examples of non-absorbing chains. And the following example is actually inspired but by what Markov did in the first place. Actually, Markov was a Russian scientist who invented Markov chains to describe the generation of texts. So I think what he did is that he looked in texts at what is the probability that a vowel is followed by a vowel or a consonant and the same for consonants. Now, let us assume that we want to generate a random text, but a text that, well, we would like it to resemble maybe something from a certain language. So, the first thing one can do, which I did here, is that I used an alphabet. So, the alphabet. So, I used all 26 uppercase letters. I also used 26 lowercase letters. And I used some, uh, some punctuation marks. So, you see we have like the, you know, exclamation mark, interrogation mark, and we have a comma, and we have a semicolon, and uh, we have the period, and we actually also have spaces and so on. So there are about uh, maybe 60 different signs here. And in this first text, I just used so each new letter is picked uniformly at random in uh, this alphabet of maybe 60 elements. And <clears throat> it doesn't look like anything. I mean, for instance, there are way too many uppercase letters. You don't have that in a, in a real text. And also, there are far too few uh, spaces. So the words are very long. So it is uh, completely unreadable. So now we can try to improve on that, and the first thing you can do is, well, in an actual language, the different letters do not appear with the same frequency. So what I did here is actually, uh, this is from some lecture notes, I used French text, some uh, novel by Balzac, and I computed the frequency of each letter in my alphabet in this text. So in French, we know that actually the most, uh, the, the letter that is the most frequent is the letter E. So there will be more E's in the text. And here I generated a text at random by, so choosing each new letter independently of the previous ones, but with the correct frequency. And so you will, see that, uh, well, for one thing, there are far less uppercase letters, which is uh, what you have in a real text. And also, if you count the number of letters E, for instance, you will find that they are more frequent. But still, it's, there are many uh, problems with this text. For instance, you have here a word uh, starting with a period. You have a word ending with an uppercase letter, and uh, this we don't want to see. So how can we imp improve this? Well, one thing we can say is that now we take the same text, but each letter we will not choose the next letter independently, but with a certain probability that depends on how often a certain letter in my reference text is followed by another one. So in other words, in my reference text, I look at the letter A and I look how often it is followed by the same letter. So in French, uh, you never see usually an A followed by another A. 
So, uh, so here we'll, we'll have a probability zero, but A can be followed by B, and I will have a certain probability, and by C a certain probability, and I, I take, do the same starting with letter B. So it could be followed by A, B, C, and so on. And I compute all these frequencies from my text set. So this gives me a big transition matrix of size 60 by 60. And then I use this matrix as the transition matrix of a Markov chain. And here is what I get with my uh, sample text. So you see that, well, it's still a gibberish, but there are some words which actually exist in, in French. So, for instance, I see here the word dent, which means tooth, uh, and e here, which means them, pour, which means for. So, you see, it looks a little bit more like a French text. And also, now you can see that uh, capital letters are always at the beginning of the word when they occur, and punctuation marks like uh, periods are at the end and so on. Now, how about other languages? So, the funny thing here is that if you use reference texts with other languages, the result actually allows you to guess what the original text was. So for instance here, well, what do you think was the original language? Well, let's look at a few words here, or maybe a few uh, properties, like for instance we have this WH that appears several times and we can look at a few other peculiarities of this text. So actually uh, here the original was written in English. Actually I took a, a text by William Shakespeare. So this is what you get by generating a random text based on Shakespeare. And if you look a little bit, you will, I'm sure, find some words which actually exist in English. And here's another example. So, you see, one difference is that now you have more capital letters at the beginning of words. And I'm sure you recognize that the original text was actually written in German. So in German, the rule is that uh, names or well, uh, substantives actually are written with a capital letter, and uh, this is why you have more capital letters here. And again, even though it's still gibberish, uh, it's German-looking gibberish. So these were my examples of random texts and. These are now not absorbing Markov chains, so it's a different type of chain, and we are going to see what it is. But first, let me give you one more example. That one I already mentioned in uh, my talk on the on irreversibility. It's called the Ehrenfest urn model, and it's a model in which you have two urns, a certain number of balls that represent molecules, and the rule is so, for, for instance, if you start with all balls in the right-hand urn, then you pick one ball at random, but no matter what ball you pick, you will end up with one ball in the left-hand urn and two in the right-hand urn. But now, if you start from here, you have a two-thirds probability of picking a ball in the right-hand urn and ending up in this state here, but you also have a one-third probability of going back to the left state. So the, if, if I write 0, 1, 2, and 3 for the states of my Markov chain, so that gives me the number of uh, balls or molecules in the left urn, my transition probabilities are like this. So I have one here, I have one third here, then I have 
two thirds and two thirds. And here I have one third and one. So what are uh, properties of uh, these examples? Well, what is important here is uh, the concept of irreducibility and actually a Markov chain is said to be irreducible if any state is reachable from any other state. So for the Ehrenfest model it's quite clear, so I, from zero I can reach st state one in one step, state two in two steps, state three in three steps, and since I can go all the way back to state zero all possible transitions are possible. For the texts, well, it's actually irreducible because I take a text where all uh, possible letters occur and if I take one letter, uh, if the text is long enough, after any letter I will at some point find any other letter. So I have this irreducibility. Now one question we are interested in for this kind of Markov chain is does the nth power of the transition matrix converge to some limit if n goes to infinity? We remember for absorbing chains that was true, so p to the n converged to this special uh, matrix 0, f times r, 0 identity, but what happens for irreducible chains? Well, one thing is that it is not always the case that p to the n converges to a limit. And let me take one example, which is actually the Ehrenfest model with just one particle, which is a quite boring Markov chain, but it's still a Markov chain. So it just has two states, 0 and 1, and you just go from each state to the other one with probability 1. So actually, if we state, start in state 0, well, we will at time 1, we will be uh, in state 1, and at time 2 in state 0, and then again 1, 0, we will just alternate between both states. And the matrix P will be given by 0, 1, 1, 0. And if I compute P squared, well, 0, 1 times 0, 1, that is 1. 0, 1 times 1, 0, that is 0. And then I get 0 and 1. So that's the identity matrix. And then if I multiply by P again, I will get P and so on. And so you see that actually P to the power N will be given by identity or P, identity if N is even, and P if N is odd. And so here I have something that prevents p to the n from converging to a limit because it oscillates between two states. And actually what we say here is that this Markov chain has period 2. So that's one thing that prevents convergence of p to the n. And the other possible problem uh, preventing convergence is that if I have an infinite number of states, then it may, it may be that p to the n converges, but it may also be that it, well, it converges but to zero everywhere. So in some sense, if I look at finite parts of p, it will converge to zero, but my probabilities will get more and more diluted, so it's not the kind of convergence we want to see. So let us look now at some conditions that guarantee convergence. So the first important concept is recurrence, and we say that the state X of a Markov chain is recurrent if, starting from that state, the chain will return to that state with probability 1, but possibly after many steps. And if X is not recurrent, it is called transient. Then we have a stronger property called positive recurrence. So positive recurrence means that in addition to being recurrent, 
So I will return to my state x, but the expected time is finite. So that is a stronger property. It may be that I return to my set at some point with probability 1, but that the expectation of the time is infinite. So if it's finite, the state is called positive recurrent, and if not, it is called null recurrent. So uh, what this means is that, to summarize, I have uh, so the following options. So x can be recurrent, or it can, can be transient. And if it is recurrent, there are two more subcases, so it can be positive recurrent, or it can be null. So these are the three possible things that can happen for a state x. And now one important result in the theory of Markov chains is that if the Markov chain is reducible and it has one state x that is, say, transient, then actually all its states are transient. And I can replace transient by recurrent and positive recurrent. So if one state has this property and the Markov chain is irreducible, all states have that property. So that allows me to define the notion of a transient Markov chain, a recurrent Markov chain, a positive recurrent or null recurrent Markov chain. So transients, recurrents, positive recurrents are what are called class properties. There's one more thing we need, uh, that's the concept of period, and we have already seen this in uh, the, our simple example. So here I fix a state x, and I look at what times I'm back at that uh, state with positive probability. So, you know, it could be something like this. So I, let me write here my times, 0, 1, two, three, four, and so on. And let me, so at time zero, of course, I am at site, at state x. Then maybe I am again there with positive probability at time two and at time three and uh, maybe at uh, later time five and so on. So in this case, my set capital T will be the set 0, 2, 3, 5, and so on. So here I have 5. And the period will be the greatest common divisor of these numbers. And that is actually 1, because here I have two consecutive integers. So here the period is 1. But another example would be if, uh, so that's actually what we have seen in our example. So let me put again my time 0, 1, 2, and so on. So what I can have is that I am back at my starting point with positive probability at only at even times. Then my set T will contain only even integers and its greatest common divisor will be 2. So then I have period 2. Now, one thing we know for this period, uh, okay, so first of all, uh, if the period is 1, I will say that my state is aperiodic. And actually, again, this periodicity is a class property. So if uh, my chain is irreducible and has one state which is aperiodic, then all states are aperiodic. And I have similar statements for periodic cases with higher periods. Now, uh, what are these definitions useful for? So let me give you a couple of important theorems. So 
The first important theorem is the following. So let's assume my Markov chain is irreducible. Then actually it admits an invariant probability distribution if and only if it is positive recurrent. So invariant probability distribution means a probability distribution of my set of states which remains the same after one or many iterations. And actually if that is the case, the invariant probability distribution is unique and it is related to the mean recurrence type. So what this means is that the invariant probability of a state is inversely proportional to the recurrence time. So uh, if the recurrence time is small, meaning I return to that state after a short time, then uh, the probability of that state the invariant probability will be large, and if the recurrence time is large, then the probability will be small. So let me just give a proof idea of this important result. So let me say that I fix the state x, and now I'm for any state y, I'm going to define a quantity, which is, let me write gamma of y. So it's the expectation starting at x of a certain sum, so over time, so going from 1 to the first return time to, to state x. And here I put the indicator of xn equals y. So indicator means that this has value 1 if xn is equal to y and 0 otherwise. So what I have here, that is the number of times I visit, so the number of visits of y between two visits of x. So what this means is, let's say I have my state x here and my state y here, and I start from state x and I do some trajectory in my space and at some point I visit state y. Then maybe I visit state y again before returning to state x. So in that case my sum here will be 2. So gamma of y would be 2, except I take the expectation over <coughs> all real realizations of the process. So uh, two things we can see is that what is gamma of x? Well, for x in my sum here, only one term will be 1, that is when n is equal to tau x, and so gamma of x will be 1. And the other thing you can see is that actually gamma is invariant. So the intuition behind that is that you know, if you keep returning to state x and then we are looking at average numbers of visits between visits of state x and somehow uh, this will remain the same in the course of time. So gamma is an invariant measure, but it is not a probability measure. So we have to normalize gamma. So how about the normalization of gamma? So to be a probability measure, the sum of all probabilities has to be 1. So here the normalization, I compute the sum over all y of gamma of y. And then you can show that you can actually swap the sum, so you can put the sum inside the expectation and the sum over n. So I get here the sum over y indicator xn equals y. Okay, but this sum here, well, that is just the sum, the probability that I am somewhere that is equal to 1. 
So I actually get the expectation of tau x. And now that means that if I take gamma but divided by the expectation of tau x, that will be an invariant measure and the value at x will be what is given here. And since x is arbitrary, I have my result. Now, another uh, important result is about convergence to this invariant probability distribution. And the theorem says that if my Markov chain is irreducible, positive recurrent, and aperiodic, then, <coughs> well, first of all, I know by the previous theorem that it has a unique invariant probability distribution pi and actually uh, whatever the initial distribution I start with the probability distribution of xn is converging to this pi and there is uh, the different ways of proving this but a particularly elegant one is called Döblin's argument so what you do in this argument is that you take xn, yn, which are two independent Markov chains with the transition matrix P, the same. And now you say that x0, that is your arbitrary starting distribution, and y0 actually is starting with the invariant distribution. This means in particular that yn will always be distributed according to pi by definition of invariant. And uh, then you look at the process zn, which is the pair xn, yn. So this now uh, lives on a much larger space, which is the product space of the individual spaces and what you show is that actually Zn will hit, it hits what is called the diagonal which is the set of all points of the form xx. So it will hit it with probability 1 at some point and once it has hit this state well, xn and yn will have the same distribution, but the distribution of yn is pi, and so the distribution of xn will also be pi. And that is how you show this result. And actually, aperiodicity you use at some point to, to prove this fact that you will hit the diagonal. Now, Let us look at uh, an example, so Ehrenfest's model. I already mentioned that before when I talked about the Ehrenfest model in the context of irreversibility. Actually, for, for this model, you can show that pi is equal to the following thing, 1 over 8, 3 over 8, 3 over 8, 1 over 8, and that's actually a binomial distribution of parameters. So there are uh, 3, which is the number of values, and 1 half, which is the success probability. And actually there's a reason behind that, which I mentioned in the other talk, which is that here I have four states, but I can actually also uh, enlarge the state space by numbering the different uh, balls in the urn. So they have numbers 1, 2, 3, and now I have eight states depending on where these uh, each ball is. And some of these states are, so the states uh, I use here are actually decomposed in smaller states. So. So this state here 
I decompose into three smaller states, the same one here, depending on which is the isolated uh, molecule. And I get eight states, and these eight states are actually arranged on a cube. So I have a picture of something like this here. With here, that is the state where all molecules are on the right. Here I have the states where they are all on the left, say. But then I have three states with one on the left, two on the right, three states with uh, one on the right, uh, three on the left. And for this system, by symmetry, the invariant probability measure is just uniform. So I have one over eight everywhere. But then since this state here combines three states here, its probability will be three over eight. And <clears throat> In that case, well, actually, uh, this is not aperiodic, so it has a period of 2. So it means that p to the n will not actually converge to, uh, to a limit. However, one thing you can do is you can modify this model by saying that maybe with probability 1 half you stay in this state, and then you have to modify the probabilities here. So let's say that for each state I remain in that state with probability one half and I change all uh, other probabilities to uh, so accordingly. Then actually in that case p to the n will converge as n goes to infinity to a matrix, what is it? Well, whatever the initial state, at the end you will arrive in state 0 with probability uh, 1 over 8, state 1 with probability 3 over 8, and so on. So actually the limit will have all rows equal to the same thing, which is this invariant probability. Now, the other interesting thing which I mentioned in this, uh, this talk is that I can compute the expectation of the return time to zero, because that will be pi of zero uh, inverse, one over pi of zero, and that will be eight. And for state one, it will be eight over three, and so on. But in general, if I have n, so n uh, molecules, then the mean return time will be, okay, again, the inverse of pi of zero, but now pi of zero is one over two to the n. So you get here two to the n. And that is very large when n is large and that gives you these large so mean return times to these extreme configurations with all atoms in one arm and no atoms in the other arm. So let me uh, finish with a few things about random walks, which are another important example of Markov chains. Uh, more specifically, I will talk about symmetric random walks. So what is a symmetric random walk on Z, on the, the line of integers? Well, so I have states which are 0, 1, 2, 3, minus 1, minus 2, and so on. And actually from zero I have probability one half of going to one, one half of going to minus one, and I have the same for every side. Now the symmetric random walk on Z2, that is a similar thing, but now I'm on the square grid. So I have, 
something like this. And now starting from a given site here, I have a probability one quarter of going up, one quarter of going to the right, one quarter of going down, and one quarter of going to the left. And I can do the same for any uh, dimension, so three, four, whatever. Now, what is interesting about these random walks is that actually the symmetric random walk on Z to the D is null recurrent, so recurrent but not positive recurrent in dimensions 1 and 2, and it is transient in dimensions 3 and larger. So how do you see that? Well, the basic idea is that in dimensions 1 or 2, you show the following thing. So, so you look at the probability starting from 0 that at time n you are back at okay 0 or any other state, it doesn't really matter. And you show that this is actually infinite. And in dimension 1 you can actually compute these probabilities exactly and in dimension 2 uh, you can also do it but it's actually sufficient to get a lower bound. And so what this means is that actually 0 is visited infinitely often. And that actually you can show implies recurrence because you keep getting going back to that state. Uh, so that gives me recurrence, but why is it not positive recurrent? Well, you see that actually pi, if I have an invariant measure pi, is actually translation invariant. So it's a measure, an invariant measure has to be constant. But since it's constant, it cannot be a probability measure because a constant measure on an infinite set cannot be normalized so that the sum uh, of all the values is one. So, so that is, uh, you know, not not a probability measure, whatever constant measure I choose. And by one of the previous results, since I have no invariant probability measure, it cannot be positive recurrent. And in dimension 3 and larger, what you show is actually that the sum, similar sum here, of the probabilities of being back at the starting point is actually finite. And the intuition behind that is that actually in dimensions 3 and larger you have much more space and in that way you can kind of explore space and uh, do things where you never come back to the starting point. So you have a positive probability of never coming back and so the starting point is not recurrent so the chain is transient. So these were some uh, properties of Markov chains. Now don't think that uh, Markov chains on infinite sets cannot be positive recurrent, so they can be, but you have to use something else than a symmetric random walk. So for instance, you can use Markov chains that are attracted back to, to zero. So the more you go to the right, the more likely it will be to go back to the left. And similarly, if you go to the left, you will, you're pulled back to the right more and more strongly. And if you do this in a suitable way, you will get a recurrent Markov chain. And so it will have a unique invariant probability distribution. And then another application, but I talked about that previously, uh, is these Markov chain Monte Carlo methods that are useful in simulating expected values of complicated processes. So that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed the talk and I hope to see you again very soon. So take care. Bye.